So uh, when we, we always have a discussant uh, for, for this, and so what better person to, to discuss Rochelle's work uh, than Kevin Averett, who has obviously uh, has written, done a lot of his writing on issues of culture, um, and, and also sort of uh, has done a lot of, uh, has, has done work in uh, the Middle East, and so Kevin, we thought would be perfect to discuss it, and he was gracious enough to accept. So Kevin, uh, we'll make a few comments, and then we can open things up to, to, to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I became interested, I'm, I'm peripherally interested in, in these, although I, these matters, military culture, uh, although I have been writing on culture as a translator for, for other disciplines and other constituencies for a long time. And one of them happens to be the military uh, lecture on culture at the Naval War College and, and so on. So I, I haven't been doing research on it, but I have a longer um, history of this. The, the history began in 1996-97 when I was a fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and a lot of my colleagues there were doing Somalia. They were doing, trying to understand the debacle that, that had happened, Black Hawk Down and everything around. And I was I'm not a Somali expert, but it seemed talking to them that it was clear that they went in having no knowledge of tribal clan structures and segmentary opposition and a few things that are general knowledge for social anthropologists. And that one of the things that happened is that the uh, American forces became the 13th clan. They became enveloped in the conflict system of the social structure without realizing that, that this was happening. So I became interested uh, in this. The interest was deepened because um, over the years I've worked on different projects with my colleague in the School of Public Policy, Dave Davis, who directs the Peace Operations Policy Center. I worked with him on a number of projects, mostly short-term things. It's one of the things is that I working in this context, I'm not the anthropologist doing long, immersive field work. And uh, he, he came to me um, in the late 1990s asking me to read uh, a proposal for contract work in Bosnia uh, on something called information campaigns, which I had not heard of before, but he explained to me what it was. And uh, I said, would you just have a look at this? And I said, well, I'm not a communications expert. He said, yeah, yeah, but you know culture. Have a look at this. So it was all about how NATO uh, in Bosnia, out of Sarajevo mostly, was, was going to run its information campaign to, to sell Dayton, to sell the Dayton Agreement to the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it focused on the information officers, the press officers of NATO, of all of the different embassies that were involved, of OSCE, uh, of some of the NGOs, a search for, for common ground and so forth, and it really focused on all of the Western players. And I said, uh, Dave, the one thing I don't see here is that you're going to actually talk to any Bosnians. And he looked at me and I said, you know, I don't know much about that place and I don't know much about that war. What I do know is that there was a bloody newspaper in Sarajevo published every day during the siege, Oslo Bajenia, I think. Right? There was a newspaper that was coming out in that language every day. And he said, oh, can we put your, your CV on the contract? And I said, no, because you need someone who speaks the language. Uh, you need someone who maybe did field work in Yugoslavia before this all happened. He said, no, no, this is due tomorrow. <laughs> and, and we need your CV. So one of the many, many <laughs> compromises that the anthropologist makes working in this kind of policy kind of thing is say, all right, put me down, put in some money for a translator. And, and one of the things that, that I did, in fact, was I spoke with um, uh, radio stations and TV stations and news presenters and journalists uh, about what they did during the siege and what they were doing to sell Dayton. And, of course, one of the things I found is that they weren't doing very much to sell Dayton, no matter how much the embassies were or OSCE was. And, in fact, all of this was going on. So the reason to tell this, this story is to say that long before Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the voices of the targets of the intervention, these were humanitarian in interventions, 
uh, what was then called in those days UTWA, Operations Other Than War, which the enlisted personnel I spoke with called it Operations Other Than What I Signed Up For, by the way. Um, the, the, that, that even back, back then, even in a NATO setting where it wasn't just Americans, um, the notion that one had to attend to the voices of the people was not very uh, prominent. The, the, the other thing is that, um, in, in fact, although it makes sense in this kind of project to start with Iraq and Afghanistan, it's important to, to remember that a concern with culture was in the air soon after the Cold War ended and soon after uh, Frank Fukuyama's notion that the end of history had occurred was shown to be the nonsense that in fact it was. And it came out in terms of uh, Samuel Huntington's clash of civilization, right? So we, 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 we no longer have the ideological enemy of socialism and communism. We now have these, these civilizations, Confucian and Cynic and, and, and Islamic, and that's where the fault lines are. That's where the next conflicts are, are going to be. You had Robert Kaplan's work. and so, so in fact, long before the military paid attention to it, there was this sense that culture matters, but it matters in a conflictual model of the world. And that's the larger kind of context in which it occurred. Um, and then, of course, when we stopped doing operations other than war and got serious and did war in Iraq and Af Afghanistan, then finally the kind of cultural ethos floating in, in, in the air had to be confronted for reasons that you discuss so, so astutely, had to be confronted by troops on the ground. Um, let me say something about military culture that I have learned over the years, and that is that um, although there has been for a long time a lessons learned center, lessons are never learned. And if they're learned, they are reliably forgotten. And some of that has to do with the way military careers are structured and rotations and, and doing the different jobs. It, it, it's, it's an interesting question of organizational culture. And I want to make that point, I hope, in an emphatic way, momentarily. Um, I think part of the reason why <coughs> the US, in particular, has not paid attention to culture in these settings is that um, although some would argue that we have an empire, we have never really thought of ourselves as an imperial people. So the Brits knew they had an empire and in the Indian civil service and in, 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 in the British system, you were promoted partly on mastering those, those languages. And of course, some uh, have argued that our, our own field, anthropology in, in Africa and the Rhodes Livingston Institute and so forth, were the kind of intelligent, intelligence gathering handmaidens to the district officer in Africa. So the Brits knew they were imperial, and they knew that if you're imperial, you've got to know something about the culture, if only to manipulate it. Because you see, power doesn't count if you're the single British district officer or the, or the constable and you're commanding 350 armed native troops. In, in that case, you are powerless. And so understanding the culture, even if too manipulated, was important. By the way, understanding your own culture was also important if you read Orwell shooting an elephant, the kind of positioning that you had to do for yourself. Um, and the French had a colonial sociology in North Africa and in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia. A lot of it was wrong, but they had a colonial sociology. And the US never did, partly because it never had an empire in that way. Maybe the Philippines, a little different, I'll come to that. But it never did, and we never think of ourselves as an imperial people. In fact, what we think of ourselves is as a people who rely on power. 
So rather than colonizing chunks of Mexico, we stole it fair and square. So we don't, you know, we weren't a colonial power. No, we were an occupying power, and I want to come to that in a moment. Um, so I think you're quite right when you say power occludes culture. And if your doctrine of the world, if your approach to the world is shock and awe, then there's no need to engage in any kind of cultural communication or dialogue. Now, I said lessons are never learned or learned and reliably forgotten. So, um, let me read to you from the first counterinsurgency manual. The first counterinsurgency manual was um, called the Small Wars Manual, and it's a Marine Corps manual that was put together in 1935 and then published in 1940. And what it comes out of is the unique experience of the Marines as an expeditionary force, as a constabulary force, uh, as a force that um, fought small wars, often insurgencies, counterinsurgencies. Uh, between um, 1900 and 1916, the so-called banana wars, which is what they're called in Marine history, uh, in Panama, Cuba, San Domingo, Dominican Republic, most of you know that the Marines occupied and administered Haiti from 1915 to 1934, and that they occupied uh, Nicaragua in two stages, once against Sandino in, in two stages, from 1912 to 1933. So the Marines were an occupying administrative force. And out of that experience came the Small Wars Manual. And it's a remarkable, you can get it online, I mean, you can read it online, you can buy it if you want a hard copy. And it taught me many things, how to pack a mule, uh, how to cross a river under fire. But it has these sections that they call psychology that, that, that we would call culture. And I want to read to you some of this because it's really remarkable thinking about the kind of searches and interrogations that, that, that we did. So this is from their chapter on psychology. Now, the chapter is, is full of cultural stereotypes and condescension and uh, uh, arrogance, and there is a racialized discourse here about the natives. So this is not post-postmodern stuff. But I just want to read several things they say in the section on, on psychology. Um, states are naturally very proud of their sovereignty. National policy demands minimum interference with that sovereignty, although on occasion there is a clash of opinion between the military and locals in power in a given situation. The greatest tact in diplomacy is required to bring the local political authorities to the military point of view. When the matter is important, final analysis may resort to more vigorous methods. There's always <laughs> force in the end. Before a compromise is attempted, it should be clearly understood that such action does not sacrifice all of the advantages of the opposing opinions. Next thing, the natives are also proud individually. One should not uh, use any humiliating punishments or issue orders which are unnecessarily hurtful to the pride of the inhabitants. In the all-important interest of discipline, the invention and infliction of such punishment, no matter how trivial, must be strictly prohibited in order to prevent the bitterness that will naturally ensue. Here's one that I like particularly. You, you refer to it in terms of, you know, the well-armed uh, men uh, getting hearts and minds. Often, natives refuse to give any information and the uninitiated might immediately presume that they are members of the hostile forces or at least hostile sympathizers. While the peasant, while the peasant hopes for the restoration of peace and order, the constant menace and fear of guerrillas, insurgents we'd call it today, is so overpowering that he does not dare to place any confidence in an occasional visiting patrol of the occupying forces. When the patrol leader demands information, the peasant should not be misjudged for failure to comply with the request when by doing so, he is signing his own death warrant. 
attitude and bearing, a knowledge of the character of the people, well, that's a little essentializing and totalizing, but a knowledge of the character of the people and command of their language are great assets. Political methods and motives which govern the actions of foreign people, and so they're here talking about actions being guided by political motives and interests. This is not so much condescending. Political methods and motives which govern the actions of foreign people and their political parties, incomprehensible at best to the average North American, are practically beyond the understanding of persons who do not speak their language. If not already familiar with the language, all officers upon assignment to expeditionary duty should study and acquire a working knowledge of it. Now, you know, first time tragedy, second time farce, you talk about ironies here. But it's in some sense astounding that the lessons that were learned in the fighting of these small wars, which is to say when the U.S. functioned in most ways like an imperial power in those banana republics, that that knowledge which came to these officers after 15, 20 years of occupying passed down uh, should be lost. Now, my understanding is that in 2008, 2009, 2010, the person who was then commanding the 1st Marine Division recommended the Small Wars Manual as reading. Um, the, 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 so we can talk about postmodern irony, but it's really tragic. And the next thing that I want to say, and the last thing that I want to say is to agree with you that um, I think this interest in culture um, is ephemeral, uh, that it's already passing, hasn't passed, that in those engagements, uh, once again, power occludes culture, the necessity for communication and for understanding, and the drones are probably the most obvious symbol of that. But in a larger sense, uh, we are already planning for the next serious in, in engagement. I don't know if that's Iran, but the next serious engagement is, is China. And I'm sure lots of people in the DOD are in some ways happy to be doing what they understand, which is forward carrier task force and so on. Well, you could get back to power, you could get back to shock and uh, awe, you could get back to the jobs that folks who sign up, who enlist, sign up for, which is to fight the nation's wars, not to engage in ethnographic understanding. Thank you. Well, um, I think that means time for some questions from our, from our audience, and um, Rochelle, if you want, I can take point to people for you or you why don't you choose sure. and I'll, I'll take notes yeah. Yeah. Um, very interesting uh, discussion but first of all isn't the idea of winning hearts and minds and occupation inherently incompatible you do hearts and minds so you don't have to occupy and there's a bit significant difference between Afghanistan and Iraq they, I don't think they can be bundled because one has a certain le level of legitimacy versus the Iraqi operation, at least from the moment Bremer entered the scene, became a heist. It was armed robbery. So it's sort of like teaching armed robbers in the ghettos, uh, Korean. So when they point the gun at Mr. Kim, they should ask him. And the, the discussion was articulated by Ayatollah Ali Sistani, who <laughs> Bremer couldn't meet for a whole year, and he said, uh, Mr. Bremer, you are an American, and I'm an Iranian. Why don't we let the Iraqis make their own decisions? So that was, and it wasn't about culture, it was about resources. So ultimately, the question is, how do we teach Americans about their own culture? Because I'm very, uh, it's difficult for me to find Americans who know about their culture because anthropology is always studying some other culture. So as an outsider, insider, I can see there are these problems. Like uh, uh, Richard Nixon said it. He said, uh, because the president does it, it's legal. 
for Americans, because Americans do it, it's moral, even though it may be morally repugnant to occupy another country. And so if the mission is uh, illegitimate, anything that goes into it is not legitimate. And the last issue is, is it ethical for anthropologists to collaborate in cases where we're dealing with a heist? There's a book called Weaponizing Anthropology. I think we should invite this guy and have a second conversation on this. Sure. Um. You had a number of points here, so let me start. The mission and its legitimacy, um, I have a personal history with that. Um, and one of the things I try to do in this, in my academic presentations, is not make too much of my own sort of own political stands um, um, too public in them. And I'd work really hard to kind of try and steer a very unwieldy ship down a very kind of rough river. Um, but as an anthropologist of the Arab world, I feel very, very strongly about these things. And I would happily testify in a, in a court that Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld, and Bran Branmer should be, should be tried for war crimes. I mean, I have no doubt about that. That what they did to Iraq, I mean, they destroyed a country. They destroyed a population, and they killed thousands of people because they decided that they should go to war with Iraq. So, I mean, I, I feel obviously very strongly about the Iraq case because I know it. Um, but, so when, pe when people in the military would say to me, and I have a number of stories about this, they would say to me, well, what should we be doing? And I learned a lot about the military in this, and I would say, well, we shouldn't be occupying other countries. We shouldn't be invading and occupying other countries. And they would say to me, we don't have a choice. We are the military. We are told by the government what to do. And so I learned to say, I know you don't have a choice in this, but I'm a taxpayer and I'm a voter. And I would say, we as a, as a population need to say more strongly, you don't just go invade countries because you think it's the right thing. So I think trying to understand the military's point of view, though, is they're, always, they're looking for a solution to something that they are handed, that they are told to do, and that they don't have a choice. Um, so that's about sort of mission legitimacy and illegitimacy and those sorts of things. Is it ethical for anthropologists to do these things? The, anthrop the American Anthropological Association spent a long time working on the human terrain teams and systems and critiquing that. And it's against our code of ethics to put the, the people that you work with um, in harm's way intentionally or even unintentionally. So I would say, no, it's not ethical for anthropologists to work for the US military or any military on an occupied population. For me, it's black and white. Is it ethical for anthropologists to work for the military in the military studying the military? Yes. And I would wish more would do that. But to go study Iraqis or you know Koreans or Kenyans or whoever it is and then tell the military about them with the idea that they could be targeted, that these sorts of things, that you know, villages could be dismembered, removed, whatever, that violates our code of ethics, which nobody has to sign. I mean, it's not like the Hippocratic Oath, but, but I think it's a pretty strongly held belief among most people. Your last kind of question was, or your first question was sort of about um, American culture. And, and there actually are now many more anthropologists that work on sort of America. Um, and then there's tons of sociologists, obviously. But, Another paper that I've written that I seem to be unable to get published because I try to publish it in politics journals and I'm an anthropologist so I don't write in the right way, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm determined. I'm just going to rewrite it. I wouldn't recommend trying to write like a political scientist. No, well, I'm, I'm, I, that's what I'm doing. I'm now trying to shift into writing Coming in a more... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's a political scientist. <laughs> Is... In reading all of these, I mean, listening to and then rereading and trying to understand all of these interviews that I did with, with, with the military, was the sense of American exceptionalism that they are trained in via military kind of training, and that I think we also sort of have as Americans and part of how we're raised. And so I write about kind of this sense of American exceptionalism and how they bring that to Iraq and to Iraqis. And they see themselves as like, you know, 
bringing, I mean, as, as, as Kevin was saying, this, this kind of colonial, like, you know, bringing, you know, good things to these poor people. And when I talk to people, I'm like, you know, Iraqis were, they're very proud of their histories. You know, like, they got some of the major, like, high points of, like, history, <laughs> in their own history, going back thousands of years. I mean, they were, like, reading and writing before Europe was... Dressed. <laughs> yeah, for your yeah, exactly. I mean, it, and then you know, I mean, then some of the the military that I interviewed were really interesting because they were say they would say, yeah, we learned, we learned that like you know Iraq is the cradle of civilization and you know with those ziggurats and what they were and when we would tell we, the Iraqis that we were working with that they knew this that we knew this they would get so excited and like they would bring us tea and they'd become our friends because and I'm like holy mal I mean it just the, the little that these that the troops had to do in order to get Iraqis to kind of respond to them kind of astounded me. I mean, it wasn't like they had to know about al mutanebi and they had, or they had to be able to recite Arabic poetry. All they had to do was to know that Iraqis had a sort of a rich history and be impressed by that. And that was like they could they could totally get in to sort of Iraqi kind of good graces. Um, that the people on the higher levels and the hierarchies never kind of connected that and made sense, but that the people on the ground, the, the troops on the ground did get that, I thought was, was an interesting kind of... So, so the troops really learned how to kind of use these sorts of things and instrumentalize their knowledge in ways that the hierarchies just sort of never got. They just gave you, do this and don't do this. Let, let, if I may, let me footnote uh, Michelle's uh, observation about military culture by reading the last paragraph, the summary paragraph of the chapter that deals with psychology, which is a culture in the Small Wars Manual. Now, remember they were in Haiti 15, 16, 17 years. Think about Haiti today, right after they left. But here is the last paragraph. It says, the purpose should always be to restore normal government, to give the people a better government than they had before, and to establish peace, order, and security on a permanent basis as practical. Gradually, there must be instilled in the inhabitants' minds the leading ideas of civilization, the security and sanctity of life and property, and individual liberty. In doing so, one should endeavor to make self-sufficient native agencies responsible for these matters. With all that accomplished, one should be able to leave the country with the lasting friendship and respect of the native populations. To quote a former president, mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? Um, Michelle, I very much enjoyed the presentation. Um, I'm wondering, though, on the smart card that was handed out, other than the headscarves, which was wonderful, um, but. I didn't see any glaring errors in, in the description of the ethnic and religious divisions of Iraq. The descriptions of the Afghan ethnic groups seem to be, at least on the surface, there's, there's certain, always more depth and complexity when you know more about it than I don't. Um, but if you were going to give an 18-year-old from Indiana who's just been sent to Iraq or Afghanistan a very short card form that's how they learn what they learn, we can't expect everyone to be a PhD anthropologist. It, what's wrong with getting away from the meta? You know, we, I agree with you a thousand percent that we shouldn't have been there and that these were morally uh, and, and you know, pragma prag pragmatically wrong. But as a divorce from that, mm -hmm. what better education would you have wanted to give uh, our, our troops? So, I mean, I, I too, I think that if you need a smart card, if you need to kind of like, you know, just something that tells you who and what they are, that this is not, I mean, some of it is incorrect, like the sort of clothes and gestures parts. Um, some of it is, I mean, like Islamic flag meanings. Green, I can't read them here. Green, red, white is purity. Black is something else. Muslims often fly <coughs> colored flags to observe various holidays or, or dates of personal significance. Each color carries a specific meaning. I, 
I could not figure out why this is on the card, but then I, see, there's somebody told me, or I kind of thought about it, that the troops must be seeing flags on houses, must be seeing markers on houses, and rather than think that they are um, sort of signals among counterinsurgents or attackers or whatever, that, that they were therefore then trying to, that they wanted to say that these don't mean anything. But then once the Iraqis realized that they, that the troops are seeing, that the U.S. is seeing these flags and not responding to them, that, does that mean then the Iraqis start using flags? I mean, the whole kind of, like, does this mean that, that they can then relax now that they know what the flag means? I mean, it just is a kind of a strange kind of snapshot to give people, I think, in some ways. I mean, in other ways, I think this is really useful. I think actually the most useful page, I mean, I think it's really useful to know something about Islam. I mean, I don't have a problem with, the, with this kind of presentation of the material or what is necessarily in it, aside from what is wrong in it. But a lot of what I've t talked to about with the military has been, you know, this 18-year-old from Indiana. And we don't learn, and so, so I think it weighs more in the area of pedagogy, which is the problem. We don't learn our own culture by reading it on a smart card. We learn our own culture by interacting with people, by <coughs> acting things out, by being told you did something wrong or did something right, by you know getting slapped upside the head, or you know by getting told to sit down and you know some I mean, your friend buys you beers, right? Be because you're doing the right sort of cultural things. So to turn what we all we all have learned culture, we all know culture our own, if and we may be multiple. We all know multiple cultures within our own culture. We know how to hang out with our, with our ultimate frisbee playing friends. Um, we know how to um, hang out with our grandparents. And we know we don't talk about the same things in those. We don't do the same things. I mean, one of the things that they say is on this, that every person that in the first group I interviewed was don't put your, don't show Iraqis the bottom of your feet. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I guess it is really an insult in Iraq to show someone the bottom of your foot. So if you're sitting next to them, you shouldn't, as a soldier might want to do, kind of do this so that the bottom of, you can't really see me, but so that the bottom of your foot when you're sitting here is in his face or her face right here. So yeah, I mean, do that. But I mean, if I sat here and did this, right, you all are like, what? <laughs> because I. I should know better than to do this in this environment. Or if one of you did this, I would stand up here and go like, hmm, why is that person doing that? What are they trying to communicate to me? So we all know these things. So I don't understand why you don't put a bunch of these of the troops in the room and have them kinetically, physically walk through these things and learn these things and get slapped up the high side of the head. And you know, some of them get slapped up the side of the head and some of them get down to sit drink tea. But, I mean, one of the things I think that's really important about when we think about the 18-year-old, they're not going to college. I mean, they chose to go into the military, not to go to college, right? In part because they probably have different, also, um, learning skills. They may be much more physical, kinetic sort of ways. And so we should teach them in those kinds of ways, in ways and in the ways that we learn culture. Does that kind of get out what you're? Um, I, I just think we should have a smart card for the eventual occupation of America. I'd like to see the first draft of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every day is too much. I mean, the troops on the ground, they use what they need to use to get by, whether yeah. it's, you know, hello, thank you, directions, some kind of description. So, you know, it's Ramadan, so you're working with an interpreter. So. You know, if he's fasting, don't don't eat in front of him. Some of the things that when you're interacting with Iraqis or, or Afghans that, that you day to day can, can be helpful. A lot of military members have interpreters who help them guide them through culture, history of Iraq or Afghanistan, thing, things of that nature where you have you know, there's people on patrol that you encounter every day who may speak a little English, but you have an interpreter, you build relationships with them, you're working daily. So to use these cards, I mean, there's pictures on some of them as far as IEDs, um, and a lot, you know, do the Marines look at whether 
he has a red, I'm sorry, whatever the name is, that he's taking Head, a hostage scarf, in yeah. a, you know, a country that had a, has a monarch or had a monarch. Um, <coughs> sure, they look at him, but again, going back to what do they care about? What is their leadership telling them? Uh, the boots on the ground and the Marines on the ground or soldiers on the ground is a lot different and it's a totally different story of what's going on at the general level or the colonel level or people who are in staff jobs putting policy on the ground. Mar Marine, me, in 03 during the invasion, I didn't, you know, I wasn't worried about nation building or whatever we were calling it, but to fill the void, who is there? The military is there. So if the foreign policy and the policy of DOD or the State Department is not there, the military falls mm -hmm. into that yeah. void. And when you get an order, fix the power grid that you just, you know, somebody just dropped the bomb on, I mean, you're stuck. You know, mm -hmm. what do you do? Well, sir, we just destroyed that power grid. Okay, we'll rebuild it. But there's no connection, you know, State Department, I've escorted State Department folks, and just the policy of, you know, they're not going to go in downtown Ramadi in 2004, 2005 without a military escort. So what are you planning to get done? What are you going to get done when the military is really the only people who will walk down Route Michigan or Route whatever because it's so it's so dangerous? The State Park, I'm not doing it. I'm not leaving this wire. I'm going to do everything. Well, who's building, you know, if, what is the military supposed to do if you're the only one who has a presence in yeah. the country? So, I mean, I'm just... Curious as far you know if, if you work with State Department folks or you know there's just that I guess it's the the argument of you know what does the military do when they're sent into a country you know there's you have to have boots on the ground which leads into drones you uh, know we don't occupy but we need boots on the ground to, to get our mission accomplished so you know it just builds a lot of questions even for the military you know sure the you know, what do I do as, you know, I have I'm a mid-level commander or whatever, you know, I have a battalion or, or whatever, or just a company or a platoon or a squad walking around on the street. What, you know, what am I supposed to do daily to make a difference and yeah. to implement, I don't know if everybody here is strategic corporal, but, you know. Go AWOL. <laughs> yeah. no, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, realistically, we got, I mean, we got to talk about. Do you want me to about. respond? Yeah, you, would you like to respond? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're totally right. And I think, I mean, I think that that's really a problem. I mean, I think that that is kind of the conundrum, as, mm -hmm. as I like to call it, is, you know, the military was, to use a very unacademic word, was really screwed in this process because they were told to do this and provided with sort of no kind of governmental, I mean, this was the Bush administration's policy, and you guys had to go out and do these sorts of things. What, I didn't talk about translators at all in this, in this presentation, but they were huge. I mean, people thought the cultural training they received and the cards they thought they had were, were worthless for the most part. They mostly, none of them said it was very useful. But, so I said, well, where did you get most of your knowledge? And they said, oh yeah, our translator. The problem is most of the low-level people on the ground didn't have translators. The translators were up in the higher levels because they were needed in the kind of more official meetings with sort of people. And so the, what I've been sort of interested in is kind of understanding the hierarchies in the military and who gets what sort of resource. So as people kind of figured things out, then I was interested in trying to figure out, well, did they talk to the people, to the units that were replacing them? And some did if they had time, and some didn't because they didn't have time or because they were, you know, busy cleaning all of the equipment or moving all of the equipment and they didn't have time to sit around and say, you need to make sure you talk to the guy in the pink house, here's his name and here's his cell phone number, but don't talk to the guy in the blue house. Da, da, da. Some of them didn't have time to do that. And so as the occupation has gone on and on and on in Iraq for seven years and in Afghanistan still ongoing, one of the things that the military people that I interviewed were saying to me was, the Iraqis and the Afghans, they know we're going to leave eventually. They know that every nine months, 12 months, whatever months, there's a new unit coming in. And that may, new unit they're going to have to start all over again with. So the Americans coming in are seeing a larger kind of picture of the American presence there and building on that and stuff. And the Afghans and the Iraqis know that the commander that they've been dealing with for however long, he, they, they've got X number of 
months to work with him or her, and then that person's going to be out of there, and they've got to, and the person who comes could be better, and the person who comes could be worse, and they may have to, and so they then become, I think, in many cases, very passive about their sort of interactions with the military, or they get what they can from the one who's there, and then they have to wait and see with the next one. So the way the actual military is deploying people in units has been also um, um, kind of contributes to this with the length of the occupation. I mean, I, th I mean, if there's one thing that I want people to understand from the work that I will publish and have done up to the present, that is that we should not do this again. I mean, you say what should you do when you're given this, and I think, as he said, I mean, I think we really, really need to take sort of hard looks at this sort of thing. And I have the luxury of being an academic and being able to say these things and being able to publish in these ways, and I have that freedom, and I know the active military do not. I mean, look at Shin, Shin Seki for, you know, for actually speaking out. He was outed. I mean, so, you know, I, I understand that luxury, and I sort of want to use it to the, better, to the benefit of this country and the potential countries that are out there. And another question way in the back, standing. Yeah. Uh, the question is, my name is Jared, you know, the question that we probably have to ask ourselves is, who is preparing your smart cards? Because they are notoriously wrong. And sometimes they are very insulting. I remember in, as a captain, not everyone about these and other smart cards I was exposed to when I was in the Army. I remember uh, I was sent to Cuba before Cuba became a, a base for uh, to go terrorists. At that time, we were supposed to take care of the uh, Haitians coming across. And then the smart card said that, OK, this is what happened to Haitians. When they, when they die, they tend to put their death on the table and eat with them before they bury them. I said, who, who wrote this thing? I went to, the, to these guys, but they don't know where the information came from, uh, apparently. So I, ch I challenged it, and then they removed it from the smart card. So Good basically, to, to tell you, the smart cards are not seriously wrong. What do you do in a case like this? What do you challenge the smart cards? But since we realize that we, military military, have a you know, cultural knowledge deficit when we go into these countries, is that, what are your thoughts on having a, what you call a cultural or religious attaché, it posted at some embassies to learn about what's going on. Maybe the attaché can pass some information to the military. Hopefully, and we will be better equipped. Before sure. We put sure. Attaché. They just don't have a clue about what's going on in the country. Well, yeah, sure. so, the embassy has a cultural attaché. Well, but the military yeah, so does as well. Generalizing statement. I don't think you can make that decision. So let me yeah. answer your yeah. question. Who's preparing the smart cards? These particular ones were done by a group called Quick Point, which is one of the Bellway companies. Oh, okay. um, no they, they do. <laughs> well, the military has contracted out so many of these kinds of things, which is the way the military, I mean, that's the evolution of the military. So much is, is contracted out. Um, I will say the, the, the ones that came out of the Army trade dock, um, out of Fort Huachuca, on the Afghanistan, they didn't do an Iraq one. They did a Yemen smart book. They've done a, they may have done a Somalia one. Um, they've done a whole bunch of them. They're much better. They're much, much better. I mean, much more accurate. Um, they have people doing the cultural training in Fort Huachuca who are from the countries, that, which does not mean that, they, that the training is therefore good or bad. It just, I'm just saying it. But I did a presentation at, a, at the trade Oc conference um, a few years ago. And a bunch of the cultural trainers came up to me and they were like, oh my god, thank you for saying that these things were so bad and what the problems are with them because this makes our life a little bit easier. Because when we say this is ridiculous, they don't believe us. So, um, so the people who are preparing them are different. I mean, some of these were contracted out, but now there's these other ones that are coming out of, for, of the trade-off. But as to the issue of the kind of cultural attaches, that, that's what FAOs are, foreign affairs officers in the military. <laughs> And the Army has more of them. I have the numbers somewhere, but I'm not going to pull them up off the top of my foreign head. Area, yes, foreign, area, foreign, foreign area officers, yeah, FAOs. And the, the Marines have some too. But what I've understood from them is that they get, and we, I've actually had a few students who are FAOs, and in, in, I teach in the Master's in Arab Studies program, but they get pulled out of the normal trajectories of, of um, promotion. promotion. And so somebody who wants to be an FAO is then saying, like, you know, okay, I'm going to kind of pull myself out. I'm not going to have advancements in, in, uh, in my career. So the military has then also 
sort of demo, I mean, devalued them by, by putting them in that position and rather than keeping them in the normal hierarchy in which they could go up and up. So, you know, it's sort of, what do they say, cutting off your nose to spite your face or something? I mean, it's just sort of a non... It's not universal, though, because the Army appreciates that the Marine Corps right now is still dealing with their has it, area and regional area officers. Has it changed the then? Well, for the Army, it's been for the last 20 years, it's been a career field. And so right. within that particular career field, you can progress. You can. Uh, in the old days, like you described, you couldn't. You couldn't. Because if you didn't go back and do whatever those other jobs were, well, you wouldn't. So they've created it as so a group. Yeah. But, but the point is, is not that they're the guys who advise the rest of the military on culture. The point is, is that they're embassy tools, mm -hmm. that they're the military representative to an embassy's mm -hmm. country team. And that's why they learn about that culture, not necessarily to translate that back to. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to second that. <laughs> yeah. How was it feel? Oh, okay. I, I, I spent time in the embassies. My job wasn't really to learn about the culture. I was able to learn the culture before I get there, basically. However, <laughs> what I'm thinking about is someone who, because when you look at it, so these countries have, there's a subset of the culture that deals a lot with religion, mm -hmm. or maybe it's interlaced. So this guy, the, the major or the uh, captain colonel who goes into these embassies, really are not really expert at knowing the, the, the religious so, aspects. So here's what they're starting to do. So this is the Air Force one. They're taking every airman, um, and they're sort of trying to train them in some ways. This is, um, not everybody can be an expert, but they're saying everybody should get some sort of training. And then they have enabled airmen, which they're thinking about in this way, and then they have expert airmen. So they're going to be training. Um, they're doing this sort of culture general to cultural specific, so everybody learns sort of what is culture. And then they have other people who are more regional or language um, <coughs> experts. Sorry, I don't have, but this is the idea. So this is what, I mean, I don't know if they're still doing these things, but this is what they had planned out in, and all um, four branches had to have, all have cultural training institutes, and they are all doing targeted training to people, for people. So, yeah. I think we have time for only one more, and I just, Diane, I saw something. Sorry, I just go. Thanks, for, thanks for your presentation. I, I was curious about, you said that the one takeaway is it's easy to understand is that, okay, don't engage in occupations, but, in terms of the role of anthropology in, in, in the in military, I think that seems to be the larger question that we're orbiting here, um, like weaponizing anthropology, if you will, um, because it's relevant for our field directly also. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, is your message that, um, and I can't tell actually, is your message that we ought to be doing cultural education in a better way, and that anthropology ought to be more valued within the organization that is in the DOD, or that, or, or something else? I mean, I guess that's maybe, let me put it that way. Is, 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 the, is the takeaway that, that this is not good cultural education, we ought to engage in better cultural education, we ought to have anthropologists and conflict resolvers in the organization taken seriously and promoted, or that instead that there ought to be some kind of disconnect that's enforced, and those seem to be maybe two sides of, the, of extreme reactions. Yeah. I don't know that I have a solution to that, and I don't know. I mean, I'm... What I'm trying to sort of do is comment more on sort of what has happened and et cetera. David Price wrote the Weaponizing Anthropology, um, and I I sort of correspond with him on lots of lots of subjects, and he's he's done a huge, long, I mean, for the last century he's I mean for till the 20th century up to the present he's looked at the role of anthropology in the military and these sorts of things. One of the speakers at the TRADOC conference that I was at in 2010, um, he said we should think of culture as a weapon system. And one of the one of the um, captains that I was that I sort of vaguely knew, he said he said, "Oh my God, we just lost the academics." Mm -hmm. And I think he's right. I mean, I think once, once, and some of my other friends were like, "Don't worry about it. Everything's a weapon system in the military. I mean, they just weaponize everything." And I was like, "Well." Um, but but I think so I, so I sort of think it hinges on two things there's always going to be anthropologists and others I think in some ways it's a personal choice and I didn't like I said I don't think it's bad to have anthropologists in the military I actually think it's a good thing I think it would also be useful to have sort of education experts in there teaching people how to teach about culture if that's what they want to do there are other people who will never will never touch this stuff I will not take money from the US military to do anything related to this project. I will not, because I would feel that that would somehow compromise it. Um, and I wanted, so it's always been money from my university 
um, I think almost entirely, and the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq um, pay, uh, gave me a grant to interview Iraqis. So I think a lot of it is going to end, be a personal choice. And now that there's a sort of a huge glut of PhD anthropologists and others in the market, they would be, if they're paying attention, then the military wants to engage with this, they would be smart to start hiring people because they probably could, because people need jobs. But, um, so I mean, I think some ways this is just much more of a personal choice. I'm, I'm kind of unwilling to come down on saying, yes, we should do this better, or no, we shouldn't do this better. Um, because that's not my, I, I mean, I don't feel like that this is mine. I did not ever go to Iraq in the military capacity, nor Afghanistan. I'm trying to sort of stand back and look at what happened and listen to what people are saying about it. And I'm not a policy person. I'm not going to, I mean, so what I will do is put my material out there and other people can make that decision. I mean, I think it's fraught. I think it's really difficult. And I find, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a fourth generation Californian from Northern California. And my, you know, my brother went to Cuba instead of going to fight in the Vietnam War. When, so, I mean, I come from a family of like, like war is not the answer sort of people. Um, and I find the willingness in Washington, D.C. to kind of s not think about those things and just say, well, that's what I have to do because um, that's my job. I find that sort of uh, unfortunately not reflective um, about what we as a human being are doing in, in terms of other people. And I certainly am sympathetic and understanding of people who join the military for the reasons that they do and why they do, to defend the country and all those kinds of things. But I think that that, that, that comes with real, um, just understanding that is important for as individuals. I know that, I, that was just no answer to your question, but. We try to answer it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> And I think on that point, uh, let's thank Rochelle uh, for coming and, and thank you very much.